Okay. Um, one thing that has been pointed out to me, they changed the textbook sections back to the way they were just before we started first semester. Like, within the last two weeks before we started first semester, they added an additional section that was section one in each chapter that was like an introductory section. And now they've gone and taken them all back out, which means that my section numbers are off again. I, I wish they would just stick with one. So when you're doing your um, concept coach stuff, Basically, just subtract one section from everything because of that offset. And, I mean, I checked this just before the semester started, and it was still like it had been, but it's not anymore. Yeah. Do you think you could put, like, concept coaches we have to do on this? Well, they're, they're, on the, uh, they're on the syllabus, although we're now behind by a day already. But on the, on the schedule, it shows them all. So we go back yeah, we have to go back one. Um, yes. So yeah. what were we supposed to do today? Um, th all of chapter 19. I think that's what it was. Yeah, all Yeah, there's just two Through the end of it, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I don't have control over that part of the textbook. I made the syllabus. I do have control over being behind a lecture, and I try not to do that. Hopefully at some point, God will bless us and we'll get back. So today we're going to be looking at charge, electric potential, and capacitors. Of course, capacitors is what it says in the syllabus, but we're going to do a little bit more. So starting with a clicker question. A point charge always naturally moves to a position of lower potential energy. That was actually the clicker question we had last class period. Now we have... What does this tell us about the natural motion compared to electric potential? Sorry, I cut you off, Ann. <laughs> I thought everyone was in, and then after I pressed it, it was just disappearing. I saw that. 6082. Okay, we had some differences of opinion here. If, Anne, if I'd let Ann answer, she might have made it so we had a majority. We had six people said charge moves to lower electric potential. Eight said po char positive charge moves to lower electric potential, while negative moves to higher electric potential. And two said negative moves to lower electric potential, and positive moves to higher electric potential. Now, instead of having you discuss this, I'll go through the reasoning here. Starting with our original statement, a point charge always naturally moves to lower potential energy. So that means delta U is less than zero. It's going to a lower final potential energy. Now, if we relate electric potential to potential energy, what is the relationship? Okay. Change in electric potential is equal to change in potential energy divided by Q. So, if Q is positive, then we're going to have delta V doing the same thing as delta U. But if Q is negative, it's going to do the opposite because it'll change the sign. So since delta U is always negative, it always goes to lower potential energy, then if the charge is positive, it's going to do the same thing in terms of electric potential. So if I have a positive charge, it's going to go to a lower electric potential. But if it's a negative charge, it still wants to go to lower potential energy. But negative charge has lower potential energy at high voltage, at high electric potential. And so a negative charge goes toward high voltage. Now remember, voltage is the colloquial term we use for electric potential. 
And so we're probably a lot more comfortable thinking about this as positive charge goes to lower voltage, negative charge goes to higher voltage. Both kinds of charge are going to lower potential energy. <laughs> I really don't know why I put this slide in again. We've already gone over that. So let's go to our next clicker question. An electron is placed between two plates. One plate is minus 10 volts, one is at positive 10 volts. What's it going to do? Yes, it's an electron. Okay, this time I let everybody answer. And we had a pretty strong agreement just for the two people who didn't answer. Electrons have a negative charge. And since negative charge goes to higher voltage, the electron's going to go to higher voltage. So plus 10 volts is higher, minus 10 is lower. All right, now we got to go quickly so I can get to the third clicker question so, so I can get in and get more than 60%. Relationship between electric field and voltage, you may or may not remember this. We started by making parallel plate and saying this one here has a plus Q and this one here has a minus Q. And given those charges... We use Gauss's law to say that there is a uniform electric field in between that is equal to Q over the area of the plate epsilon zero. And that electric field, as is our rules, was going away from the positive charge and toward the negative charge. And then we talked about the the work done on charge. So if I put a positive charge in here, if I put a positive charge here, it's going to naturally have a force that is force is equal to QE. And so if the electric field is to the right, there's going to be a force to the right. And if it moves some distance D, then the work done would be QED. I have all of these on the next slide, I just realized, all the equations I'm writing. By the way, QED. When I was in grad school, it was the first time I ran into that. One of my classmates put QED at the end of every single problem he did in physics class. QED means quadrat demonstratum. What was to be has been shown just in case you've ever seen that QED and wondered about it. Or if you're you know, from California and you have the PBS station KQED. Okay, so the work is QED. Since the work is QED, then that means the change in potential energy. How does change in potential energy relate to work? No? No answers there? Almost. Change of potential energy is defined as minus the work. And so then I can finally get to the voltage difference is equal to delta U over Q is minus ED. Now, that minus sign has to do with the direction you move for voltage to go up or down. If you move parallel to the electric field, the voltage goes down. You move opposite to the electric field, the voltage goes up. So that's that my sign really is there to tell you if you're going parallel to the electric field, the voltage is going to go down. If you go opposite to the electric field, the voltage goes up. What happens to the voltage if instead of going parallel to the electric field, I had the particle and I like made the, you know, if I move from there to there? Nothing happens. 
Why? Because, go ahead, why? I was going to say, like, it comes to the dot product idea. Work was only done when the particle moved parallel to the force. So if the particle moves perpendicular to the force, there was no work done. Hence, no change in potential energy. Hence, no change in electric potential. So you have the electric field always points in the direction of decreasing voltage. If you move perpendicular to the electric field, there's no change in voltage. And if the electric field is zero, then there's no change in voltage because there's no change in energy when you move. A little problem, because, you know, we got to do problems every now and then. A battery-powered lantern, I say battery because of Eddie Murphy, go back and watch the Delirious album, bleep out half of the words and it's kosher for you know, listening to. Um, anyway, this battery-powered lantern switched on for five minutes. During this time, electrons with a total charge of minus 800 coulombs. So my Q is, well, let me use lowercase Q. Flow through the lamp. I have 9,600 joules of electric potential energy converted to light and heat. So I put my change in potential energy is minus 9,600 joules, 9,600 because it was converted, it went away from being potential energy into something else, light and heat. And then it asked me, what is the potential difference? Hmm. Very tough question. How does potential difference relate to potential energy and charge? It's change in potential energy over the charge, minus 9600 zero, zero joules over 800 coulombs, minus there as well. So it's going to be a positive change in voltage. And 96 divided by 8 is <laughs> genius. 12, okay. I, I know this is in my little times tables I learned as a kid. And what are the units going to be? Joules per coulomb. So that means our units of volts must be joules per coulomb. I think we went over that before, but just making sure. And it was a pretty simple problem to figure out. And look, it's a 12-volt battery, just like we have in our automobiles. Um, so another term for volts potential? Electric potential. Electric potential is the technical term. Okay, so the Voltage is a colloquial term because the units we measure it in are volts. Right. That's part of the reason to use the colloquial one is so you don't get electric potential energy confused with electric potential. So Zach. something is referencing potential, they're talking about electric potential? Because sometimes it just says potential, like in questions on... <coughs> yes, it's, get, it's going to mean voltage. When it's, okay. If it just says potential, it means the voltage. And Right, if I use the voltage as the colloquial term, we're all pretty clear on it. Any questions about how I did this calculation? Straightforward. You wish all the test questions were like that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Point charge. We've learned plenty about the voltage. We learned about the potential energy for point charge was KQ1, Q2 over R between two point charges. So I can take that in our definition that relates the voltage to the electric potential energy and define the voltage due to a point charge. Mm -hmm. Now, someone who's really technical is going to point out, wait a minute, I have said from the very beginning that electric potential, the voltage, is always a difference. And now here I have it written as not a difference. This is with the understanding that voltage is zero at an infinite distance away. And so I set my reference of zero and infinite distance away 
and compared to that zero infinite distance away, any other location has this mold. So this actually still is a delta V, but it's measuring with our reference infinitely far away and makes it simple to just drop off the delta V and write V is equal to KQ over R. So actually, let me just go to the graph instead of drawing my own graph and then saying, oh, wait, yes, I have a graph of that coming up. If I have multiple point charges, I can calculate the voltage, the electric potential in any location simply by adding up the voltages, the electric potential from each point charge at the location I'm interested in. Now you might say, why would I want to do this? Because you can solve the same problems using voltage or using force and electric field, but it's easier with the voltage because it doesn't have direction. So let's look at a simple example problem. I have three point charges here, locations are shown, and I ask, what is the electric potential at this point marked A? I'm not going to do all the calculation, but I am going to set it up. How do I find the voltage at A? Okay, so it's the sum of all of the individual ones. So I'm going to take KQ1 over R1A plus KQ2 over R2A plus KQ3 over R3A. R, uh, that should be subscript. These R's are the distance from charge 1, 2, 3 to position A. And so I would just add them up that way. And then we have a second question, a point charge of minus 5 nanocoulombs moves from a to, um, from a great distance to A, was the change in electric potential energy. How would you relate the change in electric potential energy to the change in voltage? Yeah, just multiply the change in voltage by my Q. So the answer to the second part, so this is, I, I will answer your question in a second. It's final is VA, and its initial is zero. And so that's how we calculate the change in potential energy. Question? Um, yeah, can, you just, can you plug in numbers for just like one of those? Um, okay. It would be 8.988 times 10 to the ninth. And Q1 had a value of 4 microcoulombs. And then, yeah, and then Q1 is a distance of 2 centimeters away, so over. Yeah, from A. So I, the, the two came taking, you know, this three zero or zero three minus zero one to get the distance. And if I if I had been doing instead of that, if I'd been doing three, it's over two up one. I would have used the Pythagorean theorem, square root of two squared plus one squared, so square root of five centimeters. Question. Yeah. I am very sloppy about capital and lowercase, but so is every textbook I've ever used. In theory, capitals don't move and lowercase can. But yeah, I think it's pretty much random the way it's used. And they're still both charges. Yes. So yeah, it's it's good to know because it, if you don't know that distinction, then you're like, well, I don't know which one is which. And yeah. 
And sometimes we'll just have two charges and say one's lowercase q and one's uppercase q. And that's how we keep two charges separate. So, you know, it can be important. Okay, the electric potential due to a spherical conductor. Okay, spherical conductor. If it's a conductor, what can you tell me about the charge distribution inside? Okay, it has a net charge of zero inside. It's important that I say a net charge inside is zero rather than a charge inside is zero because somebody could very rightly say, well, aren't there protons inside? Yes. Aren't there electrons inside? Yes. So isn't there charge inside? Yeah, but there's equal amounts. So, yeah, so it's net charge is zero. That's the correct um, terminology. What about the electric field inside a conductor? It's zero. And we had simple logical reasoning that allowed us to see that the charge, if the electric field inside wasn't zero, the charge would just have a force to make it move until you reach that situation. So inside the electric poten or the conductor, the electric field is zero. What does that tell you about the voltage inside the conductor? doesn't tell you that it's zero. Let me go back about four slides. We're flying here. Nope. Was it? <laughs> it was five slides. I should have got. Okay, here. In a region where the electric field is zero, the potential is constant. Not necessarily zero, but constant. Now I have to find the slide we were on. It should be here. So if you have a constant electric field inside a conductor, if I have a sphere that's a conductor with charge on it and net charge is not zero, the electric potential inside the sphere is going to be the same as the electric potential at the edge of the sphere. What does the electric potential function look like for a point charge? Do you remember that equation we had? Oh, I'm not going to go back. For a point charge... What was the equation for V? We used it in the problem in the last slide. KQ over, KQ. KQ over R. And we learned that the electric field outside of the conductor is the same as it would have been for a point charge at the center. Well, the electric potential is just a way of talking about the electric field, really. So we're going to have to have the same behavior outside of the point of the charge conductor that we would have had there been a point charge at the center once we're outside of the conductor. So it must be constant inside and then drop off with this equation outside as shown right here. So this is electric field E lel. And this one here, I'll just put voltage because it's shorter to write. So the potential, the voltage, was constant inside of the conductor. And then it dropped off as if it was a point charge at the center once you got outside. Whereas the electric field was zero inside the conductor, jumped up at the edge, and then dropped off if it was a point charge. OK, we are halfway through my slides. Actually, right on time. Now we're going to talk about some biological things. Why biological? Well, first, let us understand I am not a biologist. My understanding of biology is woefully lacking. So this isn't my area of expertise, but many things in our bodies run on electricity. Things like muscles and, you know, the brain, <laughs> nerves. And so... We talk about how that electricity interaction works here. And so let's start with the way nerves transmit information. You have, as it said on the previous slide, I went by without even reading it to you. I mean, why, who, you can read, we can. You all read the chapter before coming to class anyway, right? So you have basically different concentrations of ionic ionized material inside and outside cells making having a voltage difference and it's the interactions between those you have charged particles that go through or something that causes all the interactions so this here is showing how a an impulse goes down nerves 
And all I'm going to emphasize here is you have a sudden burst of voltage as the nerve fires. It's a, a sudden blip in the voltage difference between two locations. Notice it's delta V. Now, nerves I don't know very well. <laughs> I don't know the electroretinographs. <laughs> I've had electrocardiographs done on me. I've had electroencephalographs done on me. The good news is they found that there is a burning waves going on up here. And there is some sporadic activity in my chest as well. Um, so we're going to spend a fair amount of time here talking about electrocardiogram, something I do understand. So first of all, how many people here have ever given an EKG to somebody? Yeah, that's a pretty good number. First thing you have to do, when you're giving an EKG, at least if you're in the ambulance, right, that's the place I did it, you're just using three leads. And you got to know, light on the right, smoke over fire, right? Those three, okay, I said leads. That's the way physicists talk about a wire. When you talk about an EKG, lead means combination of two wires. And so when they do lead one, lead two, and lead three, lead one is looking at the voltage difference between these two. And then I think lead two is these two, and lead three is these two. So you actually can get leads one through three with those three, as I would call them leads, <laughs> that you use in the back of the ambulance. And so this diagram here is the one that I had to learn for my EMT class, except for nobody ever used that green one. Right, we just used the others. What are you doing when you're taking an electrocardiogram? What are you looking at specifically? Okay, that's what you are interpreting from it because that's where it comes from. But what are you actually measuring? The, the electric pulses through the heart. Okay, you're measuring the voltage difference from one point in the skin to another point in the skin. Right, that's what you're actually measuring, and then everything after that is interpretation. Now, if you go to the hospital, like, you know, when I had the whole pulmonary emboli thing, yeah, we go to the hospital, and they put all of these leads on, all of these wires on, and from these wires, they get their 12 leads. Like I said, the first, the first three come from just the three that I have left in this diagram. <laughs> the next three come by including the green one. So the first six of their leads come from those four wires, and then the last six come from these other ones. Okay, so then they look at your heart. This here, we probably all know, what's the name for what I've drawn here? Normal. <laughs> this one here, normal what? Normal. Sinus rhythm. Oh, let's leave it there. I hate rhythm. <laughs> it bedevils me how to spell rhythm. It's a normal sinus rhythm. A lot of people here, since a lot of people have given EKGs, probably know how to read this. But let's talk about how this whole thing works. So here I have a picture of a heart, which doesn't exactly look like a Valentine heart. My EMT teacher drew an even less romantic heart. That was the heart according to my EMT teacher. Very easy to understand as long as you, you know, have this. So almost everybody here has had more biology than me, but I did pay attention in my EMT class, so I understand this part. So we have over here on the left side, of course, The vena cava, vena cava, whatever you want to call it. Blood comes up there and goes into the heart. And so these chambers are right and left. Hmm. If I stand here, their name, anatomical positions are named based on if you're facing somebody, which side of them it is. So this is my right side, hence right. This is my left side. Hence left. So that we have the right and left, 
And then we have on top the atria and on bottom the ventricles. Now, if you're really old school, instead of the atria, you could call it the auricles, A-U-R-I-C-L-E-S, I think it is. Um, but yeah, you, none of you are that old school, right? Blood comes in from the vena cava, and what's the first thing it does? It comes in here into the atria and hangs out until the atrium pumps it. Now, the atria do not pump very hard. When I have my pulmonary emboli, well, we'll get to that. But they pump it through here, through the, the tricuspid valve. So we have a tricuspid valve. That means the valve has three cusps, so I can't make it with two hands. I need a third. And you know, blood goes through, pushes them apart, and then they slap back together to stop it from flowing back. Comes down here into the ventricle, and the ventricle is the real pumping part. The atria are basically holding chambers. They have a very weak pumping action. If your atria die, if all of that <laughs> heart tissue just dies, your heart efficiency will drop to about 85% of normal. You only lose about 15% of atria die. So it's not the worst thing in the world for your atria to fail you. Okay, then you have the right ventricle, which pumps blood into the lungs. So going out of there, you have, not shown in my picture, the pulmonary artery going to the lungs. And then you have the pulmonary, so here I'll just go out to lungs. Then it comes in from the lungs. Through the pulmonary vein into the left atrium. So the left atrium collects now oxygenated blood, and then it goes from there through the bicuspid or mitral valve into the ventricle, and the ventricle is the big pump. So that's and it comes out of the ventricle through the arch of aorta and through the body. How does this actually work? How does it make blood move? Right? That's the physics here. All the rest of this was biology stuff that, you know, what... What would I know? So we start with the normal sinus rhythm. There is something that I assume has the name sinus that sends a signal to your heart that says, hey, you should beat now. And you have, <laughs> this is where my teacher put it, hence that's where I put it, the SA node, the sinoatrial node. And you have electricity that goes from that point all through the atria, making the atrium muscle depolarize. Depolarize, depolarizing the muscle makes the muscle contract. So that electrical signal goes through the muscle, and as it goes through the muscle, it makes the muscle contract and pushes blood out of the atria into the ventricles. That electrical signal then comes, and it's actually collected by this thing that's called the AV node, the atrial ventric ventricular node. And so it's something that waits for an electrical signal, gets that electrical <coughs> signal, and it says, ah, I got it. It sends it down through the bundle of Hiss. And then you have these Purkinje fibers that go out into the ventricles, and you have a signal that goes out through those Purkinje fibers making ventricles collapse and depolarize and pumping blood through the body. The right side pumps it to the lungs. The lungs are supposed to have very little resistance. So it doesn't build much pressure. It should be somewhere in the ballpark of 25 millimeters of mercury pressure for the right ventricle. The left ventricle has to pump through the body. It takes a much higher pressure. That's where you're getting 100 to 130 um, millimeters of mercury from the ventricle. When I had my pulmonary emboli, that meant that I had just a bunch of blood clots all through my lungs. And so it's hard for blood to go through when it's clogged up with blood clots. And so when I went to the hospital, the blood pressure on my right side was like 90 millimeters of mercury. And the right side's not made for that kind of pressure, so they were really worried about me having a heart attack because of 
how hard that was having to work to try to push blood through my lungs. Now, all of this stuff here, it's electrical signals. And it's electrical signals going through a 3D surface, right? The heart is not a flat object. It's a 3D surface going, it's very hard for even physicists to model the electrical flow that's going on here. But we know some basic things. So here, in this normal sinus rhythm, you have first the Q wave. Why do we call them waves? I don't know. But this bump right here, not the Q, the P. The Q is the next bump. We have the P wave. And the P wave is the depolarization of the atria. That is, the atria are now having an electrical signal going through them, making the muscle contract, the depolariz or, yeah, depolarization of the muscle contracts, pumping blood. So that signal is the signal that you have the electrical signal for your atria to pump blood out of them through the bicuspid and uh, tricuspid valves. Then we usually just take the next region and call it 1. If you want to be real picky, it actually is alphabetical order. So that's Q is this peak, R is this peak, and S is that peak. But the QRS complex is the ventricles depolarizing. That is, it's the ventricles having the electrical signals going through them and pumping blood. And so that's your main pumping blood action. And then this out here, the T wave is the repolarization of the ventricles. Is the ventricles getting reset so that it can pump again? Now you might ask, well, what about the atria? Don't they need to reset as well? Don't they need a repolarization? They do when it comes during the QRS complex and so you really can't see that electrical signal because it's very small compared to the ventricles when they go. So that's your normal sinus rhythm. Now there are some other waves that you'll see like a J wave that occurs right in here at the ST joint um, and there is a U, a U wave that sometimes appears out here um, when you're, yeah, I think it's hypothermic or something, you get the U wave. Um, I don't know, they didn't teach us that. Did you have a question, Austin? I was just curious, if your uh, atrium was to die, would mm -hmm. you still see the same wave? No, because if your atrium dies, that the muscle now is not going to polarize and depolarize, and so you don't have that signal. So would the P and the T just not be there? Or? Um, it, it would just be basically the P that you wouldn't see. Now, this brings up some interesting things. What happens if you have the atria dies or something, you don't have a connection, electrical connection from the SA node to the AV node? You don't have that signal for the AV node to fire, right? Well, the AV node will sit there, and if it waits 1 40th of a, um, well, let me go the other way. If it doesn't get a signal quick enough, it will send a signal to tell your heart, beat, because you're going to die if you don't beat. So if your atria is dead, your heart will beat just more slowly. It's about 40 beats per minute if you're not getting a signal from your SA node to your AV node. And so, you know, that, that's generally considered bad, bradycardic, right? I think that's bradycardia. What if you get a bundle of branch block? My grandmother suddenly was going in and out of consciousness, and her heart was beating about 20 times a minute. That's what typically happens with a bundle branch, branch block when you have that bundle of hiss doesn't conduct electricity right. And what happens is the bottom of the heart there where you have the Purkinje fibers, it basically says, oh, we haven't gotten a signal. If we don't do anything, everything dies. And so your heart beats about 20 beats per minute, typically, um, when you're getting no signal when you have a bundle branch block. So the heart is actually pretty amazing in that it will try to keep you alive even when it's not working properly. And pacemakers are there to try to, you know, so your atria are dead. Well, let's just put a pacemaker in and we'll make it beat, you know, 65 times a minute 
and we won't worry about the atrium, you still have 85% efficiency and, and you move on. Right? It's not ideal, but it's not the worst thing in the world. Um, the bundle block, well, that's, we can still do that with the pacemaker. My grandma has a pacemaker, you might have guessed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this here, I don't know a name for that. It looks like it's a fibrillation of some type, but if it's AFib, VFib, I couldn't tell you. In fact, right after I took my EMT class, Napa County passed a regulation that we weren't, actually it was the state of California, we weren't allowed to look at the um, EKGs anymore. We had to have dumb defibrillators or smart defibrillators that didn't have any display, so we wouldn't try to make a judgment and make a mistake. If the machine made a mistake, we're not held responsible. If we looked at the readout, then we were held responsible. So the heart runs on electricity. It's measuring, when you're doing that EKG, you're measuring the voltage differences produced by the electrical activity in the heart. So... Yes, I spent too long on that because I always do. Our last clicker question, make sure you answer. <laughs> what part of the EKG is produced by the recovery or repolarization of the ventricles? Just to see who is. Okay, we do not have complete agreement. Nobody said the J wave, like I said. They didn't teach me about the J or the U waves. <laughs> that clearly wasn't the answer. Those are real waves, but not ones I learned about. Three, one, one, five, seven. The answer here was the plurality answer, the T wave. How do you diagnose somebody who has, well, who's not getting enough oxygen to their heart by looking at that T wave. On, I think it was lead two, the T wave was inverted. And that was a sign that my heart wasn't getting enough oxygen. And so that was, you know, the first sign that there was something besides me being out of shape wrong with me. Yeah. Um, I thought you said the T wave was for the atrium effort, and then we asked about the ventricle, and you said it was all on the QR. Um, other way around. I, it's possible that I misspoke, but it is the other way around. The atria, this here, um, the P wave is the depolarization of the atrium, and the repolarization of the atrium comes in this same time as the QRS complex. All right. We are getting toward the end. We talk about... Capacitors now. Here's where you remember me doing all this work and then remembering I had them. Apparently it wasn't just one slide later, so it's good that I did it there. This is just repeating that work a little bit crushed in space, remembering that there is no change in electric potential if you're going perpendicular to the electric fields. So this has drawn in a 3-volt line, a 2-volt line, and so on. We call those equipotential lines. equipotential because the electric potential is the same anywhere on that line, 3 volts. And those equipotential lines have to be perpendicular to the electric field lines because if you move parallel to the electric field line, there's going to be work done on a charge and it's going to change the potential. And the spacing of those can be calculated very easily if you know the strength of the electric field. This equation here, which I usually just write as V is equal to Ed, the voltage difference, if your electric field is parallel to the distance and the electric field is constant, is just that equation. If they're not parallel or if your electric field is changing, well, it's more complicated. So this only applies for constant 
electric field, constant direction and strength. But it's very useful. We're going to talk about capacitors in just a moment. And capacitors, we will start by looking and we'll always look at parallel plate capacitors where we have a uniform electric field in between them. So let's get to that. Here is an example of capacitor. Now, I'm not talking about capacitance yet. I'm going to talk about what happens when I put charge in there. If I put charge in there, notice I have a negative plate and a positive plate. So electric field lines are going from the positive plate to the negative plate, and I have an electron that comes off that negative plate. That's essentially how we make an electron gun, as it says here. An electro electron gun, such as is used in, uh-oh, that's not a good sign. The, the touch activation is not working, in case you're wondering what the bad sign was. You have an electric filament that you put what we call an AC, an alternating current voltage on it. Let's not worry about that except for to say it's acting like a light bulb filament. You're putting charge through it, making it hot. But because you're making it hot, it's going to have electrons that come off. And so you're kicking electrons off of that filament. Just behind the filament, you put yourself a negatively charged plate. Let's say negative 1,000 volts. And then I'll put a positively charged plate out here. What do the electrons do if they have a negative charge plate on one side and a positive charge plate on the other? Yeah, they go toward positive. Positive voltage corresponds to positive charge. So the electrons are going to be pushed away from the negative one and pulled toward the positive one. Now for safety reasons, we actually... Uh, I can't use my hand to erase because, of course, it's not reading my hand anymore. We make this ground instead. Oops. Remember, that's our symbol for ground. Why do we do that? So we can touch this thing and not get the Jesus shocked out of us, right? So we put that at ground and this at negative. What do the electrons do? One side's minus 1,000 volts, one side's zero. They go toward the ground because... It's not that they go to a positive voltage. They go toward positive charge, right? And they go away from negative charge. They're always going to be trying to go to the, the highest possible voltage. So zero volt is higher than minus 1,000, and they go toward that. And so then the electrons come out. And the question is, what's the kinetic energy of the electron when it comes out? And you're absolutely right. How we calculate that, I was trying to scroll up, but of course with this not touching. We go from one side to the other. Our change in potential energy is equal to Q delta V, right? And by our conservation of energy, delta E equals zero equals delta K plus delta U. So that means delta K, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot our textbook uses KE and PE. Actually, we've been using U in this chapter, so I can stay with that. Delta KE is equal to minus delta U, which is minus Q delta V. So my kinetic energy is minus the charge times the change in voltage. Now, in this case, Taking the numbers from below, my change in voltage, it went up 1,000 volts, so delta V is 1,000 volts. My charge was minus 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Minus a negative is a positive. It's going to be a positive. We actually do this calculation, though, to make life simple. We say, hey, who wants to multiply everything by 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs? And the answer is no one. No one wants to do that. So we say, let's invent a new unit of energy. Let's invent a unit of energy called the electron volt, EV for short. And one electron volt is equal to E 
the magnitude of the charge of one electron, that's a positive number, multiplied by one volt. In other words, one electron volt is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs multiplied by one joule per coulomb. So it's 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. It's a new unit of energy, and we use it because it's real simple. If I have an electron that goes through a voltage difference of 1,375 volts, its kinetic energy will have changed by 1,375 electron volts. I can multiply by one every time in my head. I never need the calculator for that. That's why we have the unit of the electron volt for energy. <sighs> I will finish with the equipotential lines. We've already talked about them. Equipotential lines serve the same purpose in physics as elevation maps do. Elevation maps will tell you what a ball will do. If I put a ball somewhere, it's always going to roll toward lower elevation. My equipotential maps show lines of constant electric potential, and if I have a positive charge, that positive charge is always going to do essentially the same thing, roll down to lower electric potential, to lower voltage. Electrons, though, do the opposite. The electrons go to the high ground. But these maps then tell you what a charge is going to do because the charge is going to try to move to, if it's positive charge, to the lowest electric potential. And so if I put a charge here, if it's a positive charge, I can say, okay, that positive charge is going to be going like that because it's the lowest potential. Okay, so capacitors and then whatever the next section is in chapter 20. Yeah. yeah. So do the um, concept coach for Wednesday that's the first chapter 20 assignment. We go one section less, yeah, because they changed the chapter section numbers. Uh.